Welcome back to another episode of Insights with Experts, where we aim to encourage and foster discussion, learning, and creating an informed global community. To view this and other interviews in detail, head over to thisyear.org, linked in the description. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to our channel for constant updates. Enjoy the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Insights with Experts. Today, we are honored to have with us Stephen. He was a former president of the California Institute of the Art. He has been in and out of the art scene in the U.S. and in California for his whole life. And he's here to answer some questions about the art space. Thank you for coming on today. I'm, d- I'm delighted to be here. The first question, so what made you want to go into art? Was there a particular time where you thought art was a possible career path? And what were your artistic influences, I guess, over the year? Any genre, any specific artist? Uh, at the heart of it was my mother, who was trained as a concert pianist, was very, very gifted, uh, but was shy and didn't have financial backing, didn't have the career she wanted to have. Uh, she raised us filled with a kind of faith that music was really where you, it, it was at, where you found spiritual uplift and found meaning in life. And so I imbibed it very early. Uh, for my father, Rembrandt played the same role. Uh, he was a country doctor and he thought Rembrandt's portraits uh, were so deeply human that uh, looking at them, uh, you just learn things about, about the nature of human life. Uh, So those were the influences. Plus, I grew up in a little town in the Midwest where it was winter nine months of the year. um, And you really couldn't go outdoors for more than a couple minutes at a time. And so I spent a lot of time reading. And and books are where literature was really my home art. Um, And that's the direction I initially pursued. I thought I was going to become an English professor. Well, I did become an English professor. and then branched out from there. And I think two of my my major influences, uh, one was Bob Dylan. Um, uh, Bob was a cousin, uh, part of the same immigration uh, to Northern Minnesota, Northern Wisconsin. His his grandparents and my grandparents uh, came at a sort of extended family. I never really knew him, but I was exposed to his music early on. And while I don't, can't say I really understood it, it just felt like the life I was leading. Uh, it just seemed more true to the feeling circumstances uh, I, I was living in than anything I was being taught in school or was encountering. Uh, another really powerful uh, early influence was Alain Rene's film Hiroshima Mon Amour, which is about the relationship a sort of love relationship taking place in Hiroshima uh, during an event uh, memorializing the uh, atomic bomb dropping on, and, and facing sort of human guilt and suffering. Uh, those remain for me really sort of iconic experience, I hate the word iconic, but experience, fundamental experiences and sort of guideposts on how much you can expect from art. You have a book written about your time at the California Institute of the Arts. Um, It is called uh, Failure is What It's All About, and it's written by Jorn Rower. Um, I just wanted to ask, what was the process like behind the writing of this book, and what was your um, involvement with the California Institute of the Arts? Well, uh, the book was really my wife's idea. Uh, she was my partner. My, she's a photographer and writer named Janet Sternberg. Um, she was my partner, really, in everything we did at CalArts for 29 years. Um, and she thought there should be a record uh, of just what, what was accomplished during that time, that with a new president and change, things would disappear and memory would be lost, and that there should be a record. She knew Yorn because he'd written an essay um, about her, her photography and her writing. And uh, he agreed to do it. His, his style is intensive research and then days and days of interviews. Uh, we met every day for probably a month for maybe six hours a day uh, with him having prepared questions that asked me difficult, they, they were not easy. Um, 
However, his interest turned out not to be the years at CalArts in themselves, but what were the influences in my life that shaped my values, um, that led to my leadership style at CalArts, and led to my ideas about what art making should be. So the book is quite, quite different than I originally uh, thought. And at first I was a little disappointed, to be honest, because uh, I wanted that record of, of the time at CalArts. Uh, but in the end, I think this is actually a more useful book, um, uh, especially maybe for uh, young people entering careers in arts administration, because it, it is really about learning on the job. Uh, and about sort of doubt and fear and how you cope with it and how you deal with people. And um, I wish I'd had it to read myself uh, when I was <laughs> starting out. Uh, in terms of what happened at CalArts, is, if, is that the second part of your question? Or um, when I got there, it had been essentially without a president for five years. Um, uh, the previous president had been drafted to run the arts festival at the time of the Olympics and never fully came back to the institution after that. Um, and during that time, there was an acting president, but the school got into a lot of financial difficulty until by 1988, when I arrived, it looked like it was going to go bankrupt. Um, I thought an institution as great as CalArts, and it already was um, perhaps the leading or most influential anyway art school in the world at that point, or I can't speak for Asia, but for the, the European and American world, um, something this good just couldn't disappear, although I had no idea how we would get it out of deficit. Um, so we, we really went there despite being warned that we were probably going to sink with this ship. Um, and it was a, it was a challenging time. Um, the, the community itself, is this longer answer than you would like, or shall I just keep going? No, no, of course, keep going. Um, the, the simple answer, which the sort of more corporate answer uh, would have been, well, you've got to reduce the costs of the institution until they match the income of the institution. Uh, and that would, in a college, that really means firing people, uh, since the main cost is faculty and staff. Of, of running a college. The community was, was so full of good people um, and so full of spirit that the idea of solving the problem by, by letting people go just, maybe I was just being a coward, but it just wasn't something I could do. Um, so in fact, we, we resorted to a, uh, my, I had a wise board chair, uh, a very successful businessman, but he could have also been an Anglican minister. Uh, he was, he really ministered to the community. Um, and he's, he gave me three years to get us back to a balanced budget. Um, and we set goals for each year and it involved growing the student body, which was actually smaller than it had been in the past. And so growing was not in itself threatening to the mission of the university um, and vastly increasing uh, fundraising. And that became, well, for all 29 years, that was part of every day of my life. <laughs> you mentioned um, previously in your answer that the book was written um, in a different style than you have imagined. And you said that it would be something that you would find useful when starting out um, with a career in the arts. So from that what would be some advice that you could give to aspiring artists that are listening to this podcast today to enter the field? Um, is it the traditional pathway of high school, university job, or does that not apply to this sort of field? Um, let me give two parts of the answer. Um, one part is, and it's one of the lessons of the book, uh, which is never to let yourself be intimidated. The world is full of people who look like they know what they're doing, but most of them have no idea what they're doing. Uh, they're just making it up as they go along. Um, I spent a long time, even once I was the president, thinking, well, there were presidents who really knew how to be presidents. Um, and then I would talk to them and they were having the same troubles I was having. Um, we were all just, uh, there's no textbook answer to this. Um, you, you learn as you go. And I think that's probably true for pretty much everything in life. 
I remember at one point in, in 1994, there was a huge earthquake in Los Angeles, which uh, just pretty much closed down the college altogether. Um, and we, we rebuilt it very successfully in eight months. Um, and I was talking to a wealthy person who was a supporter uh, and he said, you ought to write a book about this. And I said, I don't know anything about how to do this. And he said, you just did it. And I said, I know, but I just made it up. And he said, well, you know, uh, I was trained to be a lawyer and now I'm uh, an investment counselor. I wasn't trained to do it either. Uh, I just made it up. And that was that was really a valuable discovery. And I think that's equally true. Now we're talking about managers, but it's equally true in the art world. Uh, the second part of the answer uh, really is what CalArts is all about, which is uh, if you if you just do what other people do, if you if you follow the the course of um, well, let's say you're a musician and the, the sort of most secure employment for a classical musician is probably symphony employment. But if you just follow that path in life, um, you're up against thousands and thousands of people who are doing that same path, most of whom are never going to get to do what they wanted to do. Uh, that your, your odds of having the life you want are much greater if you figure out what you yourself have distinct, that only you could contribute, or at least only you and a few other people could contribute. Um, and that's 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 harder than it sounds. I mean, on the one hand, it's an issue of sort of self-examination um, and figuring out what you really do believe and what you really do care about. And I think in this world of media and, it, and the distraction, it's easy to lose track of what your own values are. You just get swamped by all the noise. Um, so a lot of the, <laughs> speaking of noise, um, uh, a, a lot of the noise is, uh, or a lot, <laughs> a lot of the challenge in the education is a matter of finding yourself. Um, and that's a thought process as well as something you learn by, by actually doing the art you do. Um, uh, the other thing is um, very few artists make it alone. Um, when they become famous, it looks like they made it alone. Uh, but there's a reason that in English literature, which is my original field, you talk about the romantic poets or the Victorian novelists, that artists really emerge in clusters uh, and they really learn from one another, support one another and, um, and help change the direction of, of thought about their art, uh, not just individually, but as as a as a group of people, although sometimes historically one person, you know, if it's Russia, you say it's Tolstoy, but Tolstoy was part of a broader generation. It was not Tolstoy by himself. Um, so uh, in in a way, uh, the, the other issue besides finding yourself is not to isolate yourself. In some ways, it's almost the opposite. It is to be open to the people around you, the influences around you. Um, we got to the point that uh, for the art school, for example, at CalArts in the, in the interview process, they were interested whether people read the newspaper or not, uh, whether, they were, whether they were really following what was happening in the world and found that that was as good a predictor or a better predictor than whether they had good hand skills as knew how to watercolor or paint or sculpt or whatever. Um, that it was the mental part of it that, that stood out. Um, so I guess I'm offering what sounds like conflicting advice, uh, but part is uh, internal to yourself and part is uh, joining with the people around you. Then in terms of the career path, um, in some ways, I mean, we, we all need mentors in some way. Um, we all need teachers. And the, and the question is just how you find those teachers. Um, and whether you need to go to the university to find them or you can find them somewhere else. Um, we had a young man in the music school and um, he'd, he'd already won a Grammy award, I think as a freshman. Um, and he called me and he said, you know, 
Kanye West wants me to come work for him. And I know my parents aren't going to like this idea. And I said to him, well, is, is Kanye West the teacher you would most like to have? And he said, of course, he's the reason I'd make the kind of music I make. Well, I said, then, then you ought to drop out of CalArts and you ought to go work with him. But just be sure that you're not just getting the coffee. Uh, be sure you're actually advancing your art when you're with him and not just a sort of employee who's taken advantage of. Um, so, so it's finding those teachers, trying to do it without teachers. Um, it's just, there's so much, there's so much guidance we all need. Um, you know, I didn't study to be a university president, but when I got to be a president, I realized in my previous job, I had encountered the people who were in fact my teachers. I hadn't encountered them in university. I encountered them uh, once I was already a faculty member and once I was, uh, I worked for a foundation for some years. Um, so it's, find, it's finding those teachers wherever that takes you. Um, and one last thing, I realize I go on at too great a length. Um, uh, the, the other, I, I think, distinct advantage of, of art schools, um, especially good art schools, is their opportunities to link up with other people who are just as serious as you are about where they're going. And that ends up helping to support your career. Again, if you can find that supportive environment without going to university, I think that's fine too, uh, but but you've got to find that that cluster. Um, uh, very few artists are able to sustain themselves unless they really find a community of like-minded people uh, to go forward with. Touching a bit about what you mentioned about finding a community to go with and about success, I think one of the most common misconception, or I guess one of the most common biases people have against the art industry is the lack of uh, career opportunities that there is a concern about if you make enough money to survive with so much competition. Uh, so what, what is your opinion? Do you think the industry is one that if you do particularly well, it's still a livable uh, career opportunity? Would you encourage people to continue pursuing a career in the arts? Well, Again, I can talk mostly about the American situation in terms of the career part of it, although we did have students from all over the world. Um, a, a part of the answer is, uh, well, artists tend, how to say this, make a higher percentage of artists sustain themselves in their careers than, than the world imagines. Um, probably as high a percentage as sustain themselves as lawyers uh, or uh, most other fields. You, you pay a little price. The salaries are not the same as they are in some other fields, most other fields. Uh, and so you pay a price for the opportunity, but you do, there's, there's strong evidence that people do arrive at sustainable uh, middle-class incomes. Uh, we don't talk about those people very much. We talk instead about the superstars uh, who, who make huge amounts of money. But that's just, a, that's like that's like less than 1%. It's, it's more like professional athletics. It's very few people break through at that level. Um, but when you then survey, and we, I took part in starting a, a, a national survey for how artists were doing um, in the United States, um, when you combine the career satisfaction that most artists feel uh, with the adequate, although not great income that most artists experience, it is a sustainable path in life. Um, it's risky, uh, but today almost everything is risky as far as I can see. Uh, the, uh, I saw some data the other day about what percentage of lawyers actually end up practicing law um, and it's a very small percentage who end up with sustainable legal careers, even though the ones who been, join big fancy international firms do very well for themselves. Uh, so maybe the risk is a little greater. Um, uh, and, and, that, and part of that would be that uh, in many fields, average is good enough. Uh, most legal spade work doesn't take genius. Um, it, it takes just doing your research and 
being methodical about it. Being a great courtroom lawyer is something else or uh, great at anything. But um, the, the, I think the difficulty in the arts is just being average doesn't get you very far. Uh, just being average is not quite sustainable. You really have to have that combination of drive and, and vision. Um, but given a fair amount of that, it is a sustainable life, yes. So we have touched a lot about your career, about your advice for um, young professionals, but art has been a part of your life for so, so, so many years. And I just wanted to ask, what is some of your personal favorites um, kinds of art? Um, what do you uh, like listening to or um, watching? Do you have a particular favorite genre of arts um, and mediums, et cetera? Uh, that, that's interesting. I, I really, there's really two sort of, first of all, I follow all the arts. Um, I, I really, one of the great pleasures of being president of CalArts is since we teach all the arts, I had excuse to stay engaged in all the arts. Um, and in a way they, at one level, they all provide the same thing, which is a little greater understanding of the nature of human life and the, the difficulties we live with. Um, and well, it's not fashionable to say this, um, a kind of spiritual uplift. Um, I remember being in New York after 9-11 uh, after when the World Trade Center was destroyed. And it was, the streets were almost silent. It was such a depressed environment. Um, and you couldn't smile. You just couldn't, you just, it just, life just felt like it had gone bad. And I happened to go to a dance concert. And I remember the moment at which this dancer sort of leapt across the stage. Um, it was a hip hop artist actually. Um, and my spirits lifted for the first, as he lifted off the ground, my spirits lifted for the first time. Um, and there's still lots of dance. I'm gonna go later this week to see Paul Taylor's Dead, but to see Paul Taylor's company. And that's one of the things Paul always did. He was, a, he was a wonderful athlete. And there's a kind of lifting of the spirit, even though he also made some really grim work. Um, in, in, recent, in recent years, I mean, during the pandemic, when we were all locked away, uh, even though my focus in my life has been contemporary work, I actually found it was Bach who sustained me. Um, in fact, I ended up taking an online course on Bach trying to understand why of all the music, he was the one that could kind of make you believe in that things would be better in the long run, that uh, there, there was a spiritual dimension to life. Um, and so in, uh, right now I'm, I'm, I'm writing an essay on uh, Thomas Mann and Bertolt Brecht. And Brecht is someone who's meant a huge amount to me during my life. And that's a whole different kind of art, a kind of socially engaged art that really forces you to question uh, your assumptions about the world and that doesn't just try to sweep you away, but tries to make you engage uh, problematical questions about how society is set up. Uh, I find these days the art that most influences me um, is actually socially engaged art of, of one sort or another. Um, and part of it is just what we, it's, we need it so badly. Um, again, I'm speaking about the United States, uh, not different places need different things. Um, but right now we're such a mess politically in the United States, um, so divided um, that, that we really need art that forces us to question, what, what are we doing here? Uh, what's, how, how could we live better than we're living now? Um, what would a decent world look like? Um, but I guess that, that's the general, I mean, I could name individual artists, but those are, those are really the categories that, that matter to me. And especially, we didn't talk about this, but what I went to CalArts to do um, was not, I mean, I said I would solve the financial problem, although I had no idea how I would do that. Um, but what I really went there to do is CalArts had been 
mostly a white middle class institution. And I thought that's not what America needed at this point uh, and not what the world needed at this point. We needed, we needed places where uh, the whole diversity or as much diversity as possible, economic, social, uh, national, uh, was brought together and we generated voices that could be heard and understood um, from every, every corner of the society. And that then once we had achieved a significant amount there, we needed to bring the international dimension to bear because we're not doing very well talking to not, uh, one another across borders. Um, and we have, to, we have to learn that. And so we started to work on, especially uh, Asian and Latin. We always had a number of European students uh, bringing more Asian and, and Latin American students to CalArts. But it was a really a social vision that was driving that, that we needed with those artists um, could, could teach us. Hope you're enjoying the episode so far. To learn more about Orakui, as well as more information about our upcoming episodes, don't forget to follow our socials for constant updates and education content. Links are always in the description. I just wanted to follow up with um, what you mentioned about um, sort of politics and art. I'm, I'm actually Russian, so I sort of feel that um, division of between politics and um, the art scene in Russia specifically because um, especially like my family, for example, we really, really enjoy um, the ballet and the museums and Russia is very rich in that um, in that sense. However, there is still that sort of political tension. And like you said, going to those art museums and seeing those ballet performances, you can see the room just light up and everyone's sort of forgetting about the problems that are outside of the theater and just focusing on what the artist is presenting. So I've, I really like resonated with what you said there. And speaking of um, your, uh, your last point about diversity, um, art is always transforming and evolving. And with the growth of um, the, the digital space, um, how do you think that transformed the art space and has it made art more diverse um, and available to different countries, like you mentioned, um, uh, Asia and Latin America? It, it, it certainly has, has made it more available. Um, they used to, between the United States and Mexico, they, they used to talk about there being a sort of five to 10 year gap uh, be, something would emerge in one country and it would take that long for it to influence uh, across the border. Uh, now, b b because media uh, crosses the borders, there's, there's fundamentally no gap. Uh, we, we, can, uh, we can advance side by side, but it a lot depends on, on who you are, uh, whether, whether, you, whether you choose to take in what the world has to offer. One of, one of the great opportunities uh, we've been all living through is in terms of world music, it's available in a way it never was before. And we're seeing that a, a lot in composition that uh, pop music that once would not have had Romanian uh, gypsy music in it. Uh, I mean, now you just, everything is available. Uh, and that, that is a great opportunity. Um, similarly with cinema, uh, soon, I'm sure we're going to have instantaneous translation, which which would mean that you can watch the the world cinema. Um, and what a thing to be able to access uh, the great cinema of, of every country. Um, a lot in the end turns on whether whether the viewer uh, is uh, is ready to take things in or not. Um, I, I just now was reading a really interesting article about uh, Polish theater in the '80s under communist Poland, which was which was which was quite repressive, um, and theater became one of the areas that people spoke up for what their lives actually were like, and there's just tremendous outburst of theater activity. Um, and eventually that that contributed something to the temporary, uh, change in in, uh, in Polish politics, although now it seems to have reverted to a kind of uh, authoritarianism. Um, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> this in the back of my mind, since you said you were Russian, I'm, I got a book I want to show you. I just read this phenomenal book by uh, a, a Russian poet, 
named uh, Maria Stepanova. I don't know if you know her. Uh, she wrote a book called In Memory of Memory. And it's about how little we know about our own family's past and how we attempt to put it together. Uh, in her case, uh, it, it was a Jewish family. A lot of the time they had to pretend they weren't Jewish and so it's not documented. Um, a lot of them died in various circumstances. Uh, so there's gaps in the family history. But it's a totally thrilling book. Um, and as important if you're an American trying to understand who we are uh, through the generations as if you're uh, a young Russian. Um, and I just, I just feel so privileged that we can, you know, I, uh, I think she's probably in her 40s. Uh, uh, a Russian feminist poet is available to us. Uh, what a thing. It's just great. <laughs> yeah, I've, uh, I've recently read a book. It's called uh, Back to Moscow. Um, and it's about um, a, a student that was in Moscow um, in the 1990s, just after the fall of the Soviet Union. It was very, very interesting to read about how it was after um, the Soviet, like Russia fell apart and became what we know it now. I think, I think in a way the, the pressure these days just to survive economically um, ha has, the sort of culture has turned us more into um, permanent um, survivalists um, and narrowed our sense of what a human being is uh, and what the dimensions are of character. And one of the great things art does is bring us back to ourselves uh, in a much broader vision, um, just, just as you're describing. Uh, of who we are, how history has shaped us. Um, um, and artists do that. I mean, one of the great advantages of the arts is <laughs> you can assert more than you know. A historian has is is really trapped trying to, you got to stay within the facts and you're you're, you're trapped with these limitations. They can be opportunities with the great historians who end up being like fiction writers as well. Um, but, but with art, you, you can leap forward uh, and imagine what else is possible in the world uh, and try to fill in the gaps with either with what you'd like to believe or what you'd like to see happen, uh, even if it's not literally what has happened. You briefly talked about how art surpass, uh, surpasses borders, but do you have an opinion on digital art and the trend that is NFT now? Um, what what to say about this? Art has art has always embraced whatever the new technologies were, and so there's in a way there's no point in resisting it. Um, my my favorite example is. Uh, the French horn. Uh, the, uh, in the 18th century, the French horn didn't have valves. And so there were only, only a certain range you could play within. And all the great music for the, for the horn was written when it was almost impossible to play the French horn. Then as soon as they added valves and it became so much easier, uh, people stopped writing great music for French horn. It's just so interesting the way this happens or um, Beethoven's piano. Uh, Beethoven was writing music that the pianos couldn't yet play. It, you can see that he's, he does these runs of music and he runs out of keyboard and has to transpose it down an octave to continue. And the piano has to be invented that keeps up with what Beethoven has already, uh, already created. Well, digital art uh, in a way is, this is just our, our, our current manifestation of it. Uh, like all art, most of it is not so great. Um, and because we don't yet have a huge backlog of great work, it's easy to underestimate uh, what its potential will be. Um, I mean, there I was talking about music and I was taking examples from the 18th and 19th, but you can't do that with digital art. Um, the, the examples are what we've produced in the last 40 years. Um, but there's, there's already enough 
enough amazing work. Um, and I think actually our, our culture has become so, partially because of these screens, so visually oriented and their digital art can do just amazing things um, that really do break through and force you to see in new ways. Um, so I, I have I have high hopes. And one of the things we had to do at Kellogg's during my time um, is go through this whole digital revolution. I mean, I started in 1988. Uh, I'm not sure we had laptop computers, and I think we didn't have we didn't have them in 1988. Um, and I remember there was a young animator uh, who was trying to do 3D animation, um, but the computers were so primitive that it would take all night long to process like 10 seconds of material. Uh, and then we managed to get uh, a, a soft image reality engine that's forgotten, but it's an earlier version of a supercomputer donated to CalArts. And suddenly you could process it almost in real time, uh, although we only had one machine that could do it. Now my laptop computer can do it. Um, and it's not an accident that when you look at animated film, uh, what Pixar has, has brought about um, with a whole, whole new styles of animation that would not have been possible uh, in an earlier time. Uh, what's interesting is that actually almost all the great Pixar animators, starting with John Lasseter, graduated from CalArts. Um, in fact, they were students together uh, at CalArts, and they used to, uh, they tell me, look around the classroom and say, if animation is going to have a future, it's us. Um, and they were working again, some of them, toward this digital future again, even though it wasn't possible yet. Um, so I, in, in some ways, you could even say that the imagination of these artists drove the technical developments that are now driving, driving the imagination of artists. Uh, I was actually inspired uh, by what, what you said, and I wanted to touch a bit about something which is valuation in art. So I think in recent times, the valuation in art and record prices of art has been brought into attention. And there have also been certain situations where individuals have left uh, random unassuming objects like spectacle on the floor, a banana on somewhere. And it was meant as a prank, but then uh, the museum, for lack of knowledge or whatever, assumed that it was an art piece and then decided to frame it up and put for show. So there is now a blurring of line between what is art and what is not art and how you value art. And I guess I wanted to get your opinion on how art should be valued. Is it up to whoever wants to pay the biggest buck for it? Is there a metric to refer to when valuing art? How do individual artists value differ? Wow, that is a very big question. Um... <laughs> First, I'll just tell a story, which was, I remember at CalArts, uh, the, uh, the maintenance people were always afraid to clean up messes because they weren't sure whether it was someone's artwork or it was a, just stuff that was left. And they knew they'd get in trouble if they, if they swept away someone's artwork. Um, again, how to say this, at least since Duchamp, um, with his famous urinal, uh, we, we've had the, the potential of uh, anything that is placed in a way that raises artistic questions being able to be included as art uh, and usefully concluded as art. Um, even though in, that, in, in many cases, it's just a repurposed found item. Um, I think one of the things that's confused us in, in modern times is, uh, and again, I'd say post Duchamp, um, is it used to be craft was how to how how you distinguish what art was from what wasn't art, um, and this oil painting was such a high level of craft that it required that at one level it was pretty clear uh, what and what entered the category of art. Um, however, you go back historically. And many of the artists 
uh, who one thought on the basis of high craft uh, were great artists have disappeared entirely as just not having mattered in history. Um, and that means artists who once commanded the high prices. Uh, so money is, money is a, a kind of temporary valuation, but it doesn't really tell you very much. Um, mainly it tells you what will, what will receive publicity and therefore may have more influence because of the publicity that surrounds the price. Um, but that's about all it, it can tell us. It, um, it's, it's very much about temporary tastes uh, rather than uh, or what seems possible or speculation. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not an adequate measure in itself. Um, to me, it, it all turns back into does it, does it lead you um, either to have a, a new kind of experience or does it lead you to have new thinking? And if it's a banana peel uh, attached to the wall um, and, it, and it actually leads you somewhere, well, then maybe that counts as art, although that particular one doesn't really sing to me. Um, but um, uh, so much depends on, again, on whether the viewer is prepared to think about whatever it is, uh, can make sense of it. Often, I think uh, all of us have the experience of confronting some new work of art or some work of music and not being able to tell, just not able to make any sense of it. I used to walk into student studios and I'd be terrified that I would look at what they were doing and nothing would come to mind. And then I was talking to some of our art professors and they said, oh, they have the same terror. Will, will they be able to figure out what the starting point is for what, what they're seeing? And they'd start asking questions and um, as, as a way to get some grounding. Um, and, and to me, it's, it, it, a lot of it is whether it, it inspires you enough to make you want to ask those questions or not. Um, I guess I just have to, um, I guess the other thing I would say is there also is a big difference between what matters at this moment, what, what is striking and weighs in and what's going to matter 10 years from now. And both are, are legitimate. I mean, a lot of social protest art, uh, I mean, on the, the, the famous uh, graphic design logo from the AIDS crisis in the United States, silence equals death. Um, that in its, in its context, that is just totally powerful statement. Uh, and in a way it's gone on carrying its meaning because it was so powerful at the time. Um. So we wanted to ask you the final question of the interview. And um, we asked this question, everyone that comes on to the podcast and a lot of experts say that this is probably the hardest question um, they get asked. And that, que and that question is, um, if you could leave the youth with one piece of advice, what would that piece of advice be? That for me is pretty clear, which is, don't let anybody intimidate you. Um, that um, you, you, have to, you have to approach the world with respect. Uh, there are people who have things to teach you, uh, but never to let yourself be intimidated by that. Um, I know I spent so much of my life, I was from this small town, it was really easy to intimidate me. <laughs> Uh, when I got to big cities. Um, and you just waste your time being intimidated. It's, uh, I had a professor once who described it as, um, if, if you're a writer and you think of all the great writers, I mean, imagine being a Russian writer and you've got Tolstoy, probably our greatest novelist, hanging over you. Uh, what, what are you gonna do? Um, here's this grant, or if, if you're an English writer, Shakespeare, just. What are you going to do with in the faced with that? And he said, you just you just have to recognize that every time needs its own uh, refiguring and its own new work and its own ways of speaking to people, um, and that we can learn things from 
others and from the past, uh, but it's essential uh, just not to let yourself be intimidated. Uh, that, that's, that's my core advice in life in general. <laughs> Oh, well, let me just say one other thing. Just this is the actual, it's, it's confusing. The actual title of the book, just in case anybody wants it, is Stephen D. Levine, Failure is What It's All About. Um, just it's confusing because it looks like Stephen D. Levine is the author rather than part of the title. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending time with us. I'm sure we learned a lot about your insights into the art scene. No, I, um, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm glad to meet you both. <laughs>